Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Angela Nwachi Willig. I'm Dean of Boston University School of Law. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our 2020 BU Law Review Symposium, Marijuana Law, Lessons from the Past, Ideas for the Future. So although cannabis use remains illegal under federal law, during last week's election, five more states passed laws legalizing cannabis for recreational and or medical use. One in three Americans now live in a state where anyone over the age of 21 may use marijuana legally according to state law. And yet it was only eight years ago, the first US state legalized marijuana for recreational use. And since then, state after state has enacted laws to permit the recreational use of marijuana, a trend that is highly likely to continue. And now the 35 states and the District of Columbia have also made cannabis use legal for medical purposes. The United States has begun to reach a tipping point in cannabis legalization. And the impact of the marijuana industry in the United States cannot be ignored. The industry currently has an economic impact of more than $50 billion and it's projected to exceed $125 billion by 2024. And still, most marijuana businesses cannot access credit, apply for loans, or receive other basic financial services. And so we have to ask ourselves, is it really good policy to force this fast-growing, multi-billion dollar industry to operate on a cash-only basis? Is it finally time for the federal government to recognize that these trends will continue to accelerate and to take action to resolve conflicts between state and federal cannabis laws? These are just a couple of the questions this symposium will address. And as we consider a future in which cannabis use is legalized throughout the United States and regulated like similar products, we also have to examine the lasting impacts of this country's history of marijuana prohibition. So consider that enforcement of marijuana laws has disproportionately affected people of color and those living in poverty. Although people of all races and from all economic strata use marijuana at similar percentages at similar rates, it's people of color, particularly blacks and particularly poor black people, not financially privileged white people who have borne the brunt of criminal marijuana prohibition. According to a 2020 study by the ACLU, black people are 3.64 times more likely than white people to be arrested for marijuana possession. And that's notwithstanding comparable usage rates. Furthermore, as states have legalized marijuana and established, regu established regulated cannabis markets within their borders, licenses have disproportionately been, been granted to white owned businesses that operate in middle to upper class neighborhoods like Brookline. And that only works to reinforce socioeconomic divides that have long existed in the black market marijuana industry due to unequal enforcement of the law. For these reasons, as the movement to advance cannabis legalization continues, it is imperative for the sake of justice and equity that we also address the ways in which racism and classism have influenced and continue to influence different segments of our society very differently. These topics as well are on the agenda for our symposium on marijuana law, as we discuss lessons from the past and ideas for the future. So on behalf of everyone at BU Law, I extend our sincere gratitude to all of the impressive scholars and practitioners who have taken time to lend their expertise to this discussion and to engage in a dialogue with all of us. I'm looking forward to many interesting and enriching discussions over the next three days. And now I'll turn this really amazing program over to my colleague, Professor Jay Wexler, who has really been uh, the force behind the planning for this year's um, symposium. Uh, and once again, I want to thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Anwachi Willig. And it is a, is a great delight to welcome everybody to this year's annual BU Law Conference, uh, Marijuana, Marijuana Law 2020. I have to say um, the title Marijuana Law 2020 is not my proudest creative 
achievement. Uh, but, uh, but, but when we first started putting this event together, which was very early in the year, I went back today and I looked at my first email that I sent about this, potentially about this conference, and it was January 8th that I sent it. And at the time, it seemed like 2020 was kind of poised to be an interesting year. And I thought, you know, this would be a good way to frame it. <laughs> but little did we know, um, uh, the, 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 the conference quickly ran into the pandemic. We moved it online as so many things have, uh, have, have been moved uh, already. And uh, but we still didn't know what what the election was going to bring uh, for anything, including marijuana law, because it is remarkable to consider, as the dean uh, just mentioned, that it was only eight years ago that the first two states, Colorado and Washington, legalized marijuana for recreational use. And at the time, it wasn't clear whether that was an anomaly or whether other states were going to follow. But it very quickly became clear that other states were going to follow in the lead of Colorado and Washington. Oregon and Alaska legalized in 2014, Massachusetts, California, Nevada, and Maine in 2016. Then Vermont became the first state to legalize through, through legislation as opposed to a popular referendum. In 2018, Michigan and Illinois followed. And that brought us to November 2020. And uh, it's been said many times since the election took place on November 3rd that while people went to sleep on Tuesday night completely unclear about almost everything, the one thing that was clear, the one clear winner in the election was marijuana legalization uh, and drug reform generally. So both New Jersey, Arizona, Montana, and South Dakota legalized recreational marijuana that night. Oregon decriminalized small amounts of other drugs and approved the therapeutic use of psilocybin. This is particularly interesting. And so now we have 15 states and <laughs> District of Columbia uh, uh, where, where recreational marijuana is legal and many other states where, where it's legal for medical use. And as Montana and San Diego, uh, South Dakota uh, illustrate, it's not just the, the blue states. The red states have also, some of them have legalized. And, it, uh, and there is general uh, support for marijuana legalization on both sides of the aisle, uh, to some extent anyways, and has led many people to point to the results of the election as once again suggesting that full federal legalization might be, uh, might be around the corner. And that might be true. But it might not be true. And the, what we know is that the president-elect has spoken only of decriminalization and expungement of criminal records, which is extremely important from an equity perspective. Uh, but they have not, for example, included these plans in their transition, uh, the, in, the, in the transition plan that was just announced. Uh, whether that means anything or not, we don't know yet. Um, but it's also unclear what's the, what the Senate's going to look like after January 5th and whether the Senate will be interested in passing uh, in, in furthering any legalization efforts. So it turns out that November 2020 is indeed a very timely moment to consider the current state of marijuana law, what we've learned from past years and what we can take from those, from those past years and, and apply to the future. And I think that we uh, have assembled a, a terrific group of experts for the next three days to talk about these, uh, the, the wide range of issues surrounding marijuana policy and legalization. We have scholars, not just legal scholars, but scholars from other fields. We have writers, we have regulators, practitioners, doctors, entrepreneurs, and others to help us understand where we are and guide us towards the future. Participants uh, are clicking in from all over the country and indeed the world. We have researchers uh, not only from the United States, but also from Uruguay and Canada to tell us about what's going on there. We have eight panels over the next three days covering everything from the history of marijuana policy to public health to social equity, criminal justice reform, the environment, climate change, tax, banking, corporate law, and so much more. So uh, very much looking forward to, to the next three days. I may not uh, have another opportunity for this, so uh, I would like to thank some people who have made the conference possible. Um, uh, first of all, Megan Kelly in the events department and her team have just done an amazing job in putting everything together. Thank you so much for everything you've done, uh, Megan, and everybody else in your office. Jeremy Thompson in communications and marketing and his team have done a terrific job in, in, uh, in, in letting people know about the conference. I want to thank the BU technology team at Let's, Deshaun Hendrickson, Nate Stelmach, Sydney Kovar, and Matthew Calvin for all their work that they're going to be, that they've already put on it, put in, and will put in for the next three days, making this go smoothly. Uh, I want to thank the administration for its support, Dean Onwachi Willig, the associate, uh, also the associate dean for intellectual life, David Weber. Um, I want to thank uh, all the BU faculty members who are participating either as presenters or moderators, and everyone at the Boston University Law Review. A special thank you to all of you. Professor Jim Fleming, who is the advisor to the Law Review, I want to give us a, a special thanks. 
to Professor Fleming. He's a conference organizer extraordinaire. He's organized like 50 conferences in like the last year. Uh, uh, and he taught, he told me, he gave me such great advice when I first started uh, working on this back on January 8th. Uh, so thank you. And I want to thank uh, uh, Chase Shelton, Colin Greer, and Kimberly Bishop, uh, the editor in chief of the Boston University Law Review, for all of their work so far and in the future as the publication. Uh, of the papers uh, it comes to fruition in, in the final version of the law review that will include uh, the, the talks that, we've, uh, that we'll be having over the next few days. So before we move on to start panel one, I do want to uh, turn it over to, to Kimberly Bishop from the law review to say a few words. Uh, and after that, we'll get started with panel one. So Kimberly, take it away. Thank you, Professor Wexler, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kimberly Bishop, and I am the editor in chief of the Boston University Law Review. And on behalf of our entire staff, I'd like to welcome you all virtually here to BU and to our annual Law Review Symposium. A very, very big thank you right back to Professor Wexler for putting together this amazing symposium filled with incredible panelists. We're really looking forward to the next couple of days. Um, thanks also to Dina and Wachi Willig for her unending support of the Law Review. And of course, um, I'll echo thanks to Professor Fleming um, for guiding us through. Um, we've very much been looking forward to this symposium all semester um, and really all summer um, and even more so now in the wake of so many electoral wins for marijuana across the country. Um, we're also looking forward to working with all the panelists over the next few months to put together our print symposium to be featured in our May 2021 issue. And I'd just like to take this opportunity to encourage all of our panelists to submit uh, manuscripts for that print symposium. And if you have any questions at all about our publication process or really, you know, what to submit, um, myself and our senior articles editor, Colin Greer, are totally available for any kinds of questions. Um, and just a reminder that those manuscripts are due uh, by the end of December, December 28th. So uh, thank you all so much for being here. And uh, we hope that you enjoy your next few virtual days here with us at BU. Terrific. Thank you so much. So without any uh, further ado, let's move uh, on to, to panel one uh, of the conference. I've really been looking forward to this panel uh, uh, ever since I even got started the idea uh, of the conference. So I'm really, really excited about it. Our topic is marijuana, public health and equity. And I am going to uh, just briefly introduce our four panelists in the order that they'll be speaking uh, and then turn it over to them. We each uh, panelist will speak for 20 to 22, three, something like that minutes. Uh, probably don't want to make it to 25 because we do want to leave uh, about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Uh, for those who are, 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 are watching, who have questions, please use the Q&A function uh, to, to relay your questions to the panel. I will take those questions from the Q&A and I will then uh, give them to the panel after all the presentations are done and we and we moved on to the Q&A session. So uh, so put your questions in the Q&A uh, in the Q&A box. Um, we have four terrific panelists today. Um, our, our first speaker will be Professor Jonathan Calkins, uh, who is the H. Guyford Stever. I hope I said that right or I probably got it close anyways. University Professor of Operations Research and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University's Heinz College. A he's also a member of the National Academy of Engineering. He's written lots of stuff on marijuana uh, policy, and he's the co-author of this terrific book, Marijuana Legalization, What Everyone Needs to Know, which is a great, great book to, to if you're getting started in this area, to take a look at. Um, uh, our second speaker is Dr. Peter Grinspoon, who is an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School and a board member of Doctors for Cannabis Regulation. He's a frequent speaker and awesome tweeter uh, on all things cannabis. So I would definitely follow him on Twitter if you're interested in this stuff. He uh, tweets about medical policy and issues and also completely randomly was my very first doctor when I came to Boston. So, and he's an amazing, amazing uh, physician. I can, I can comment on that. Um, Dr. Rachel Knox is, will be our third speaker. She's both uh, has uh, an MBA and an MD from Tufts and plays more roles and holds more positions in the cannabis space uh, than I have time to list, actually. She's, in addition to being a practicing uh, cannabo cannabinoid medicine specialist, she's also the founder and president of the Cannabis Health Equity Movement. 
She's the spokesperson for Doctors for Cannabis Regulation and the chair uh, of the Oregon Cannabis Commission and there's and many other things. I urge urge you uh, participants if you're interested in our in our speakers to, to check them out online because they've done so much more than I can mention here. And finally, our fourth speaker will be Professor Nicole Huberfeld. Uh, who is a professor of health law, ethics, and human rights at the Boston University School of Public Health and a professor of law at the Boston University School of Law, Go Terriers. Um, her work uh, focuses on the intersection of healthcare law and constitutional law with an emphasis on the role of federalism and the spending power in healthcare programs. She's written a ton in both uh, health journals and law journals about so many topics having to do with public health and we're lo really looking forward to everybody's talks today. So. Um, it's 1.20, and I'll turn it over to Professor Kalk. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and I'm really delighted to be able to participate today. What you're going to see for me is sort of a blizzard of statistics and trends about supply and demand over the last 25 years. I want to make sure that the punchline is clear. One of the biggest myths about legalization is that it's the same old, same old just without the arrests, and nothing could be further from the truth. There are very large changes in supply and demand that have important implications for public health. On the supply side, the most obvious is creating a for-profit industry that has lobbying clout and wishes to advance its profit interests, which conflict often with public health. And on the demand side, as you'll see, there have been very large changes in uh, patterns of use. So that, that's uh, the basic punchline. Legalization matters, stuff changes a lot. So if I may, I will uh, start to share some slides and be able to get into those uh, statistics with you. Um, I do want to uh, start by saying when I'm speaking of legalization, I'm talking about legalizing supply by a for-profit industry. Maybe the second biggest myth about legalization is that it is like a light switch. It's one thing that's either there or not there, and that, that's completely false. There are many different kinds of legalization. Most obviously, there's legalization only of use, and then there's legalization of supply. Those are very, very different. And even within legalization of supply, this, this slide is meant to say there are a dozen options out there. What uh, United States and Canada have done is sort of to leap from one end of a broad spectrum of options to the far and there are many other ways of legalizing supply that have fewer implications uh, for, for public health. But we in North America have gone with this commercial for-profit industrial model. So I'm gonna say a few things about trends in supply and about changes in demand. I often speak on this for an hour and a half and uh, trust me, Jay, I will not do that today. But if anyone is interested in hearing a longer version of these comments, I'm, I'm always happy to do that. On the supply side, I'm gonna focus on the impacts on production cost and price, because those are perhaps the most consequential, and also changes in the size and nature of the firms in the industry. So the most obvious thing is that legalization allows cannabis to be produced in ways that are far, far more efficient than the illegal producers can under prohibition. So what you're looking at now is a bar chart showing the cost of producing a pound of high quality cannabis, essentially over time moving from left to right as we have liberalized policy. On the far left is what it cost under prohibition before the Cole memo. Then there's a cluster of bars that are labeled quasi-legalization that is what was going on before there was licensed and regulated production, but when the official policy was non-interference. Then there's a cluster of three bars that are various forms of licensed legal production. Uh, Afria already by last year was reporting production costs below a dollar a gram. The yellow bars to the right are what you could anticipate the untaxed production costs to be after national legalization, because in the United States, we still don't have national legalization. And as was alluded to already, the federal law really matters. So the basic punchline is a spectacular decline in the cost of producing the product. This really shouldn't surprise you. I mean, cannabis is a plant. If you think about how the cucumbers you buy in the grocery store are produced, 
they are not produced um, in national forests. They are not produced in basements under artificial light. And after legalization, there's no reason why the cannabis plant should be grown the way that it used to be. These declines in production costs absolutely have translated into pronounced declines in retail prices. Even though the regulatory approach that puts most sale in bricks and mortar standalone facilities that sell only cannabis is helping to break or slow that decline in retail prices. But the fall is really quite dramatic. The cost per hour of intoxication for a new user is below a dollar. It is cheaper to become intoxicated on cannabis than on alcohol. And I just want to say that these very pronounced declines in prices are not because of any reduction in the quality of the product, quite the contrary. The potency in terms of THC has soared uh, up through 2000, the average potency of cannabis that was seized. Back in those days, you didn't have it sold in stores, so you have to get your stats from seized cannabis. It never broke 5%, and now the average potency of flower products sold in licensed stores is over 20%, so four times. And there are uh, a host of extract-based products, dabs, vapes, and so on, that are much more potent than that. So the decline in the price per unit of THC has been even more pronounced than the decline in the price per gram. And quality has also improved on a bunch of other dimensions too. The variety of products that are available, the variety even of just flowers that are available, the ability to have some testing and quality control on pesticides and packaging and truth and labeling and so on. Um, this dramatic, dramatic decline in price um, has been accompanied by an equally dramatic increase in quality. So at one level, from the consumer's perspective, this is all wonderful. From a public health perspective, the law demand applies even to dependence-inducing substances. When prices go down, consumption goes up, and we'll get to that in a little while. And that includes uh, consumption that is problematic consumption. So on the supply side, that's probably the single most important trend, a huge decline in production cost and price. Um, there's also been a complete change in the character of the industry. Back before the Ogden memo, probably the median size of a producer within US borders was 99 plants. And that's because there was a 100 plant trigger for uh, for sentencing under federal law. Um, that is a boutique operation that is roadkill in the modern industry. Ar around the time just before state licensed production started. So, so um, the Dean is correct that 2012 is when Washington and Colorado passed the legalization, but the stores didn't open until 2014. So we have data from what producers looked like in 2013, just before licensed production. And uh, you can see the stats on the screen. You can think about that as a grow house. The, the scale of the operation was sort of what you could have put into a typical residential house. Um, so gross revenues of a half million dollars a year is smaller than the typical family owned restaurant. And today it's, it's an industry. So the Canadian producers have production facilities of over 1 million square feet. They are literally producing 100 to 1,000 times as much per facility as used to be the case. And these are international firms now actively trying to produce, uh, uh, to expand their, their production and sales abroad. So the industry is just a completely different beast. This is no longer artisanal or craft production primarily by users. This is an industry and it is run as other industries are by MBAs with a, a good, good business sense. So those are the two most important trends on the supply side. On the demand side, the punchline is really that consumption is totally dominated by daily users, people who are using every day often, uh, uh, substantially every day. And this is a change. And the 
change can be observed in terms of frequency of use and in terms of the amount of THC consumed per day of use on average. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to um, compare long-term trends, not just before and after legalization, because I do think that the smarter way to understand what's been going on in North America is a roughly generation-long, 25-year-long liberalization with the actual passage of legalization being just one milestone in that overall journey. It's again, it's not like a light switch. It's not like everything changes on a dime at the moment the law has been passed. So uh, sometimes people say prohibition doesn't matter. It doesn't have any impact on use. That's really just kind of silly. Um, this is a very simple chart of self-reported cannabis use at three points in time. 1979 is the end of the 1970s period of fairly liberal policy. That's the decade when you had the first decriminalizations. The Carter administration famously had a liberal cannabis policy. Then the middle bar is at the end of 12 years of the quote unquote Reagan Bush drug war. I think drug war is a terrible term, but it is true that they had a much more conservative posture towards drugs in general, including cannabis. And then uh, 2018 is just the uh, uh, recent data. And uh, the height of the bars says it all. Um, policy does influence the number of users, but that's really not the most important story. Often things are characterized in terms of prevalence, number of users, and that misses the boat. In economist jargon, the impact of the liberalization is on the intensive margin, not the extensive margin. To skip the jargon, that means the main impact is on the intensity of use, not the number of users. Yes, the number of users changes, but the big story is the intensity of use. And I'll try to illustrate that with a few charts. Um, this first one just is simple time series over time. And I'm gonna show four lines. The first one is the number of people who report using within the last year. And that number has more than doubled over this period, but some of that is even population growth. The per capita rate is a little bit shy of a doubling. So that is an increase. There's no question that it's an increase, but it's not earth shattering. But if we switch from looking at number of people who've used in the past year, but to those who've used in the past month, well, well then it's more than a tripling. And if you say that it's really not um, number of people using, we want to fold in the intensity of use. Let's ask about the number of days of use they report. Literally, the survey says, how many days did you use in the last month? And some people say one, some say 10, some say 20. So we're going to add that up. In terms of days of use, cannabis consumption has increased sixfold. And if you say, well, that's not even what public health is really worried about. What public health is really worried about is the people who use daily or near daily, essentially people who report using 25 or 30 times per month. That has increased 11 fold over this period. Back at the Nader, fewer than a million people were using cannabis daily or near daily. Now it's a shade over 10 million. And this really is a new phenomenon. Um, what I have on the screen now is the proportion of quote unquote current users, past month users, of alcohol and cannabis who report using daily or near daily. Uh, the bottom line in black is for alcohol and it's been flat, not surprisingly. And the basic observation is sure there are some people who use alcohol daily or near daily, but the vast majority, 90% of people who drink do not drink daily. For them, it is an occasional recreational activity. The blue line that shows the dramatic increase is for cannabis, and it shows that a generation ago, cannabis was a recreational drug used occasionally, say on weekends, but now over a third of current users use it daily or near daily. In other words, cannabis in its consumption has changed from being like alcohol to being much more like tobacco, where most of the consumption is by daily and near daily users. This chart what you're looking at now is proportion of users. I'm switching now to just the absolute number of users. 
So now the alcohol line is the one on the top just because there are more people who use alcohol and it's the line at the bottom, green and yellow, that's for cannabis. And you can see that that generation ago, there were more than 10 times as many daily and near daily drinkers as there were daily and near daily cannabis users. So if, if you asked a generation ago about daily and near daily use of a dependence inducing intoxicant, that was a question about alcohol. And now that ratio is uh, less than three to two. There's still more daily and near daily alcohol users, uh, but not by a heck of a lot. And this matters for the industry and it matters for public health. And the next slide that I'll show you will, will I think make this point. I, I like to preface it by asking the rhetorical question, what proportion of the industry's sales or proportion of consumption do you think is adults with no, uh, no substance use disorder of any kind and who use, and this will sound a little strange, uh, fewer than 10 times per month. The fewer than 10 times per month is my best proxy for weekend only use. The surveys don't actually ask which day of the week you used. All right, so it's adults, no substance use disorder problems with cannabis or alcohol or any other substance and uh, essentially use only on weekends. What share of the market is that? And when I give these talks, I usually get guesses of anywhere from 20 to 80%. And the actual answer is about two and a half percent. In other words, it's just round off error. Does not matter. The industry does not make money on controlled adult non-dependent use. Um, basically, half of the market is people with substance use disorders of some sort, whether it's cannabis use disorder or alcoholism or cocaine use disorder. And then the next biggest chunk of the market is adults who use daily or near daily, but don't report any problems with it. It's not primarily youth. The youth are that wedge at the bottom. There are quite a few people under the age of 21 who consume, but they're mostly not consuming heavily. So this is a market of heavy users and that's where industry makes its money. This is a change, frequent use is the norm. All right, the last point I wanna make is changes in the amount of THC consumed per day of use over time and uh, in our understanding of it. So lots of times when you talk to uh, people my age or older about cannabis use, what they have in mind is what they saw back in college and the numbers on the slide now are, are supposed to characterize that. That is somebody who uses every weekend night, but not during the week. And they have one joint per day. That could be sharing two joints with one other person, but the equivalent of one joint. Just do the math, two days out of seven, 0.4 grams per joint, then THC content with about 4%, you come out around five milligrams per day. As I said, today, it, uh, the market is dominated by daily and near daily use. 80% of consumption is daily and near daily users. They average at least 1.5 grams per day. The latest numbers are even a little bit higher of material that's 20% THC. Again, do the math. It's just simple multiplication. That's 300 milligrams per day on average or an increase of a factor of about 65. That's a very dramatic change. And the question is, does it matter? Do we care? And you know, this is sort of where you find out whether people are optimists or pessimists, whether they see the glass half full or half empty. Uh, one attitude is this is a, a, a distinction that's not a real difference because the human body has remarkable capacity to adapt to differing doses of things. And uh, although people are consuming a lot more, it doesn't have any material, behavioral, or health effects on the users. Uh, the other view is, no, the dose makes the poison. And I can actually show you stats that are uh, eerily similar with respect to cocaine, uh, contrasting coca consumption in the form of coca tea in the Andes and the way most cocaine is consumed um, by heavy users in the United States today. And um, there's a very big difference in dose per day, and there's clearly a difference in health there. So the question is, does this matter for cannabis and uh, that's the question. And the answer is, we simply don't know. And uh, in a full length talk, I give lots and lots of these slides where I show the lab studies where you randomly control trial, give people placebo and cannabis and see what the effects are. So this happens to be a study on uh, lane tracking capability in a driving simulator. The uh, top line in the open diamonds is placebo. 
those people stayed in the lane 90% of the time, which is itself kind of scary that uh, only 90% success staying in the lane with, with no intoxicant. And then the other three lines show a dose response. As you increase the dose of THC, people's ability to stay inside the lane deteriorates. And with the biggest dose, it actually dips at one point below 50% of the time in, in the lane. So this is supposed to be a study that tells us about uh, cannabis and impairment. But what I want to point out here is if you look at the legend, the doses of THC were 16 and 20 and 46 milligrams, nothing close to 300 milligrams. The great majority of the scientific and medical literature on the effects of cannabis is exploring doses that are in that range. We really do not have much in the scientific literature about what happens when people are consuming multiple hundreds of milligrams of THC per day. Okay, so hopefully that I've persuaded you that uh, things are changing and um, these are changes that I think warrant um, some, some, uh, some study and, and some concern. The, the last thing I wanna uh, close with, people often ask about, well, what is happening with the black market? And um, this is also sort of a, a half full, half empty story. So a particular study that, that I did that I'm often asked about looked at the state of Washington two or three years after, uh, do a bunch of math in different ways and you conclude that about two thirds of Washington state residents consumption was supplied through the licensed system. Um, Maybe I should back up and say, in the very first year after legalization, the black market definitely still persists. It takes a while for the legal production to scale up. Um, so this is two or three years later. My guess is if we revisit states five and eight years after legalization, you'd see an increasing share supplied by the licensed market. And after national legalization, that will be even more true. And it gets back to that first on tape slide I showed, legal producers can just undercut on price. Um, the second point about the black market, people often note that the black market didn't disappear anywhere near that quickly in California. And they think, oh, was that because taxes were too high or something? And I think that's not the right way to think about it. Uh, the reason the black market didn't disappear is California didn't choose to push it out. Washington tried hard to shut down the pre-existing unlicensed suppliers. California didn't. And something that's sort of obvious but gets forgotten is unregulated production of anything, fill in the blank, is cheaper than regulated production of that same thing where one has to comply with all of the rules and regulations. And this doesn't primarily mean things like excise taxes. This means all of the standard laws and regulations that apply to any business, including stuff like withholding taxes for your employees. So if you merely create licensed supply, but you do nothing at all to try to suppress the unlicensed supply, the unlicensed supply is just going to keep on doing its merry thing, particularly if there are other states where it remains illegal that they can export to. So if you want to get rid of the black market, you need to do two things. You need to create the legal alternative, but you do actually have to continue to do a little bit of enforcement to um, drive out of business those illegal producers. As the late Mark Kleiman, one of my mentors said, uh, even a paper, paper tiger doesn't fall over by itself, you have to push it. So I hope those comments have been useful for setting the context of the very big changes that have been going on and I will look forward to any questions that people might have. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll do all of the presentations and then have the questions at the end. So Dr. Princeton. Floor is yours. Thank you. Um, whoops. Give me a second to figure out how to share my screen. Whoops. Can you see the slides? Um, can you guys see the slides, Jay? Yes, I can see them. Uh, uh, you've got the PowerPoint. Okay, perfect. Good. Okay, well, thank you guys <clears throat> for having me. Um, I um, have been involved with this issue for a very long time. Um, 
my brother actually was a medical cannabis patient. And um, for the last uh, year of his life, when he unsuccessfully um, struggled with leukemia, uh, cannabis was the only thing um, that allowed him to keep down food. This was in the 1970s. So my parents actually illegally um, gave him cannabis to, to help him keep down food. And also my father, um, a few of you might've heard the name Lester Grinspoon was a, was a uh, cannabis activist and wrote a book on cannabis called Marijuana Reconsidered Asking uh, for the Legalization of Cannabis in 1971. So I've um, literally been involved in the cannabis issue my entire life. Um, I've been a primary care physician for 25 years and I've been, um, uh, I've invo- incorporated medical cannabis into my career, uh, my, whole, my whole career. I was an early adopter, you know, sort of surreptitiously before it became legal and now much more openly. Um, today I'm speaking about cannabis and the opiate um, epidemic and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, I've treated people um, for opiate addiction and physicians too. Um, that's one of my specialties, treating physicians as a primary care doctor. Um, and I'm also in recovery from opiate addiction personally for 13 years. So I feel like I have a pretty panoramic view on cannabis and the opiate addiction uh, and the opiate crisis. Um, Abasso, as Jay mentioned, I worked in advocacy, working for legalization, um, working with Rachel as an associate director for the group Doctors for Cannabis Regulation. And I did work on both legalization initiatives in uh, Massachusetts. Um, and um, I do want to talk about why the popularity of cannabinoids are soaring, um, both medically and in general. Um, and I know this is a, um, a symposium and, and not a debate, but I do want to um, just take issue with a couple things that Professor Calkins said. Um, first of all, I, I, the, the fact that the price is going down and the quality is going up is phenomenal for my patients. Like literally the, the, the physicians that prescribe cannabis couldn't be happier about that. And I'm going to um, discuss why this, you'll see why this is the case as I get further into my presentation. Um, and um, let me just write down when I have to finish uh, 205. Um, and then um, cannabis is just so much safer than alcohol. And there's some pretty good evidence that people are substituting um, cannabis for alcohol. And the, it also begs the question of like, what's wrong with um, adults, not teenagers, not pregnant women, not adolescents, but adults using cannabis if it's legal. The main harms of cannabis use are the illegality of cannabis. So now that it's legal, um, I'm just not sure what the harm is. A lot of people use it, uh, not just for insomnia, for chronic pain, for anxiety, for fibromyalgia, for PTSD, but a lot of people use it to relax at the end of the day. They take a puff or two. Um, You know, they find that it helps their sex life. It helps their creativity. It helps their wellness. It helps their spirituality. It, It helps them with sore muscles. It's much less impairing than it used to be because you have so much more choice of what you can take. You can have high CBD cannabis, you can take a tincture, you can um, have a topical, you could rub it on. And I just think that um, Dr. Calkins is is conflating as the addiction community has done for the last 80 years, sort of aided and abetted by two things. One, by all the government propaganda that we've been subject to, which has been tinged by racism. And two, aided and abetted by the, the lopsided propaganda there have been studies that have shown that the, 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 the research has been focused on harms, not benefits by a ratio of 20 to one. There's been a real, really conflated um, people using it uh, recreationally for wellness with quote unquote addiction or cannabis use disorder. So a lot of the people he described as using it uh, problematically are actually people that are using it in a, in a way that, you know, in a perfect world, we'd all meditate and use yoga mats and go for walks and eat tofu. But human nature, people do reach for substances. Every single society has used reach for substances when they're stressed out. And cannabis is probably the safest substance for people to reach for. So I just think that um, Dr. Hawkins is conflating the use of cannabis recreationally for a substance use disorder. And I think that's a very uh, troubling uh, mischaracterization. And again, I know this isn't a debate, so I'm gonna move on. But the final thing I wanted to say is this argument about cannabis being stronger. Um, When I was growing up and there were all these cannabis activists and cannabis opponents in my living room arguing about this, one of the arguments against legalization was, oh, you have to smoke a whole joint to get high. That's bad for your lungs. Now it's a lot stronger and you can just take one puff and that's all that a lot of medical cannabis patients need. I have a patient with PTSD that takes one puff twice a day. He used to take six shots of vodka twice a day. 
and now he takes one puff of cannabis. The fact that it's stronger means in some ways that it's a lot safer medically. So you can't use the argument that it's weak as an argument against legalization 30 years ago and now use the argument that it's strong against legalization now. I mean, you just can't win if you're um, a cannabis uh, advocate. So anyways, um, why are cannabinoids soaring in pop? But again, I'm, I'm happy to discuss this and I think it'd be, and uh, Dr. Hawkins, I, I would love to discuss this over coffee because I bet we'd be able to come to a lot of um, middle ground and a lot of um, consensus uh, if we had enough time to flesh it out. But anyways, why are cannabinoids soaring in popularity for chronic pain? They are relatively non-toxic. As my father used to say, um, the government has spent eight decades and $10 billion looking for so much harm, they didn't really come up with that much. So ironically, we've actually found that there isn't that much harm associated with cannabis. Now, I could tell you as a primary care doctor, there's no free lunch with any medication. Nothing I prescribe is free of side effects. But with cannabinoids, you have to think, what else would you be prescribing? For example, for sleep, I'd be prescribing, well, melatonin is not dangerous, but it doesn't do much. Uh, I'd be prescribing trazodone or Ambien or benzodiazepine. And then you think of that versus a couple dro drops of uh, a THC tincture with some CBD in it. It's safer than the other things. Or for pain, what are we going to use? Tylenol that doesn't do anything? Uh, non-steroidals, which are going to give you an ulcer or a heart attack. And if they don't, they're going to kill your kidneys after five to 10 years, or a low dose of some kind of um, oral or topical cannabinoid um, preparation. So it's actually a safer alternative for many of these uh, indications. And it's safer now that it's legal and regulated. As I mentioned, you could have lower THC, higher CBD, the other cannabinoids are being, um, are being um, uh, breeded up. And, you know, it used to be just what the drug dealer had, um, which was high THC, because that's what sold. But now we have so many alternatives, it's becoming much safer. Um, and, you know, what are the main health concerns? Again, it's hard to know, because a lot of the research that's been done over the last 80 years was funded by the U.S. government with the purpose of showing the cannabis was harmful. That isn't to say that all of these studies are not true. Some of them are, some of them aren't. You have to just read them with a grain of salt. It's sort of like the home run um, champion who was on steroids. Like he did hit a lot of home runs, but he was on steroids. Um, I'm gonna skip the part about driving adolescents, pregnancy and breastfeeding. I mean, just in a nutshell, and according to our studies, driving hasn't gone up in the States that have legalized. Um, adolescent use hasn't gone up in the States that have legalized. In some States it's actually gone down because the drug dealer will sell it to anybody, whereas the dispensaries are really strict. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to get into a dispensary, but I've toured them and it's like getting into Fort Knox. They check like your ID and your card. They're very strict. Um, I think um, one area where it is dangerous is pregnancy and breastfeeding. I think that people shouldn't be recommending it uh, for pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, but then again, as a primary care doctor, I'm afraid to use anything for pregnancy and breastfeeding. And unfortunately, in some cases, you have to use something when people are pregnant. So it's a question of using um, the lesser of two evils. And then what about cognition? Um, you know, it's a really interesting debate. People have shown that it does affect, cannabis does affect attention and it does affect short-term memory. But people also say that it improves spirituality, it improves creativity. So this is a philosophical discussion about whether it worsens cognition or just changes cognition. And as it were, maybe redirect some brain cells from your left brain to your right brain. I actually, growing up, um, Carl Sagan was a frequent visitor to my household, a frequent user of cannabis actually. And I remember him and my dad discussing this in detail. And this is way beyond the scope of this discussion, but I think it is an interesting discussion. But among medical cannabis patients, Stacy Gruber, who's a wonderful researcher at Harvard, she was expecting to find a decrease in um, sort of task-based learning among medical cannabis patients, because that's what she found with recreational cannabis users. And actually in her paper, The Grass Might Be Greener, from 2018, she actually found that uh, medical uh, marijuana patients demonstrated improved task-based performance. Now, is this because the doses were lower than with recreational cannabis? Is it because they were using higher CBD preparation? Is it because they were sleeping better and they weren't in chronic pain? Is it because it was older people, not younger people using the medical marijuana? We're just not sure. And again, this needs much more study 
Also, there was a notable decrease in opiate use and benzodiazepine use as well. So there are a lot of reasons why uh, cognition was could have been improved. Uh, but the fact is, it's not as simple to say that cognition is decreased with medical cannabis. And this needs to be studied a lot more. And I just thought it was a very interesting study. So briefly, I want to talk about why um, opiate uh, users are flocking away from opiates and towards cannabis and why I think that cannabinoids, especially as we're just starting to discover them and starting to elucidate and understand the endocannabinoid system, the neurotransmitter system that mediates how cannabis works on the body. And we're just starting to understand the, you know, there are 600 molecules in cannabis and 150 cannabinoids that, you know, the molecules like THC and CBD that work on the cannabinoid system in our brains and bodies, we're just starting to learn how they work. And the potential for drug development is almost infinite. So I think that opiates are gonna go uh, the way of uh, many other drugs that um, we used to serve the purpose and are no longer relevant. But I just wanna explain on a more granular level from a doctor's perspective, why it's almost impossible that cannabis isn't gonna play a huge role in alleviating the opiate crisis. Now there are five ways in which can cannabinoids might supplant opiates. Number one, when I see a new chronic pain patient in the clinic, I start them on cannabis instead of opiates, or I at least give them that, op that option. Now, cannabis and opiates are about equal in terms of treating pain. Uh, the one exception is that for severe pain, you probably need opiates. But for the mild to mod moderate pain that most Americans have, the 40 million Americans with chronic pain that comes from us getting older, more portly, and more arthritic, um, cannabis is as effective, if not more effective than opiates. And almost universally, people report a better quality of life. And that's partially because of how the medical system is set up. You don't have to, with opiates, you have to get drug screens, opiate contracts, pill counts. Everybody treats you these days like you're a criminal if you're on opiates, which is really unfair. And I'm totally against that. But if you're on cannabis, you just go to a dispensary and it's trial and error and you figure out what works for you and it's a lot easier. Um, but there's also the quality of life factor that um, you're not like drugged out on opiates all the time. And with cannabis for pain, the doses are often very low and people are quite functional. We don't recommend that they use it before driving or work, but in truth, people are quite functional. Um, cannabis is especially helpful in end of life care for neuropathic pain, really effective for fibromyalgia and for multiple sclerosis. Um, I'm not gonna go over the studies, but I include them um, in my slides, but this just shows um, people sort of um, flocking away from opiates once cannabis has been legalized. Um, and I have to, I'm not gonna have time to go over these studies. Um, this Medicare D study, this study from, showed that when Colorado legalized cannabis, Medicare D prescriptions across the board went down. And, you know, I see that in my patients all the time, as do my colleagues. Um, you know, people, instead of getting a muscle relaxant, would just take a puff of cannabis. Though, again, we don't recommend smoking, we recommend vaping or, or, top, or uh, oral or topical because it's better for your lungs. But, you know, when people, instead of getting Viagra, they might try cannabis. Instead of Ambien, they might try a puff of cannabis. So it really is a versatile medication um, that's hurting uh, the profits of pharmaceuticals, which is why, interestingly, the pharmaceuticals contribute very heavily to the anti side of these cannabis referendums that are state by state. The second way in which can cannabinoids um, are supplanting opiates is that some patients really want to transition from opiates to cannabinoids. Um, off their opiates for chronic pain. Now, this has to be voluntary. You can't force anybody off of their opiates. That is completely unethical. Uh, the CDC came out with these dr draconian guidelines a couple of years ago. We're trying to force doctors to get people off their opiates, and that's completely unethical. So, but if any patient is interested, I'm happy to oblige. And I've seen, um, I've had a lot of success with this and people tend to be much happier once they're off the opiates. They have so much more freedom. And again, they just feel less drugged out all the time and they don't have to deal with the pill counts and the drug screens. So uh, this is a very big area. Um, unfortunately, health insurance doesn't pay for the medical cannabis. So I've had several patients that are like, wow, I was able to get off my opiates and my, and my Valium as well. And I feel great, but my prescription for my oxycodone is $1. And my copay for my diazepam, my Valium is $1 and the medical cannabis is costing me $100 a month. So I had to go back. So we were somewhat undermined by the fact that it's not covered by health insurance. Um, this is a study which I don't have time to go over. 
Um, the third way is that you could lower the dosage of opiates with medical cannabis. Um, they work on the same receptors and there's a synergistic effect on pain. And you often can lower the dose of opiates that people are on even for severe pain by up to 80% by using cannabis. And this is important because much of the harm and danger of opiates such as overdose and death is dose related. And I included a couple studies that demonstrate both that people are lowering their dosage and the fact that um, these um, are uh, synergistic in terms of how they uh, control pain. Um, the fourth way is that cannabis is very effective for opiate withdrawal symptoms. This is evidence-based. Furthermore, I have personal experience with this. The pharmaceutical remedies for uh, opiate withdrawal are terrible. Clonidine is like the main drug and all it does is slow down your heart rate. It doesn't really do anything. And there's evidence that patients on cannabis don't do worse in opiate, um, pro opiate treatment programs. And there's some studies that they actually do better. Uh, and I just want to mention that they shouldn't even be testing people for cannabis in methadone programs and in buprenorphine programs. And to kick people out of treatment for using cannabis is flatly and fundamentally unethical. Um, this is a study that shows that it's a meta-analysis that shows uh, current evidence suggests that cannabis use is unlikely to undermine medication for opiate use disorder progress. And then this is an interesting study from Vancouver that showed that among people who use illicit drugs initiating opiate agonist treatment, at least daily cannabis use was associated with approximately 21% greater odds of retention and treatment compared with daily uh, consumption, with, not, with less than daily consumption. Sorry, it's a little bit cut off. So we at MGH were all joking around, like maybe we should test people for cannabis and make sure they're actually taking it, but that's just a joke there. Um, so, uh, and this is just a study sh uh, showing that it does help with uh, withdrawal symptoms. Now, the most controversial one is, is cannabis a medication for opiate use disorder like buprenorphine or suboxone? Um, there's tons of anecdotal evidence saying it is. There are thousands of people say, hey, I use cannabis to get off heroin. I don't think that this is evidence-based. There is strong evidence that methadone and buprenorphine are associated with a 50 to 80% decrease in overdoses and mortality. And there just isn't anything but anecdotal evidence for uh, this for cannabis. Now, the way I look at it is if I'm treating a headache with cannabis and it doesn't work, you get a headache, we try something else. If I'm treating insomnia with cannabis and you don't sleep, fine, we give up, we try Ambien. But I'm not gonna treat your heroin addiction with cannabis because if we screw up, you could die or overdose. So I do not recommend using cannabis for um, heroin addiction um, as medication for opiate use disorder. I do think it helps with withdrawal symptoms, but I don't think it's responsible um, to, to recommend it. And I do think some people in the cannabis industry are making irresponsible claims about this. So I would say, yes, cannabis gets people, is good to use instead of opiates for initial treatment. Yes, it's good to transition chronic pain patients away from chronic opiate use. Yes, it's excellent for lowering the dose of chronic opiates um, for pain. <clears throat> yes, it's good for opiate withdrawal symptoms, but not yet until it's been proven um, as a medication for opiate use disorder. And I don't know who's gonna prove that because big pharma is certainly not gonna study that because you can grow cannabis in your backyard. Why on earth would they spend the money to study um, one of their competitors? They're, um, so just a couple other minor issues. I know we've only got a couple more issues. Um, I think affordability is an equity issue. Uh, upper middle class people, white people can afford it, um, but uh, impoverished people can't afford it. And I think health insurance should pay for it because they're saving so much money with all the benzodiazepines, opiates, and muscle relaxants that people aren't using because they're using cannabis. Um, I think another equity issue is veterans in cannabis. Veterans vociferously advocate for cannabis, for chronic pain, PTSD, anxiety, and insomnia. It's like the least we could do for them. Yesterday was Veterans Day. Um, you know, in the US, doctors aren't even allowed to recommend uh, cannabis. Veterans get drug tested, punished, kicked out of pain programs, kicked out of opiate programs, and, you know, subjected to the same old drug war propaganda that no one believes anymore about cannabis. Whereas veterans in Can Canada, they provide their veterans with cannabis and it works really well for their PTSD and for their chronic pain. So I just think they do a much better job in, can in Canada. Um, 
I believe that legalization is much better than decriminalization. It helps undermine the stigma, which I'm going to talk about. Um, there's no reason to have the supply illegal and the distribution illegal. If the supply is legal, you can trace it, you could monitor it, you could tax the crap out of it. And you could, if it's legalized, you can impose rules. I'm for strict rules. I think there should be no advertising uh, for tobacco, alcohol, or for cannabis. Why would you allow advertising for a psychoactive drug? There's no reason for it. So I think you should legalize it, regulate it, educate people, and have really strict rules against teenagers getting access, really strict rules against advertising. A perfect example of this was the e-valley, the lung um, problems that came from the vapes. As it turned out, the studies have shown it was mostly the unregulated vapes that caused the problems, not the vapes from the regulated markets. And I could tell you, if opiates were legal, nobody would be dying. It's the illegal fentanyl that's killing everybody. But again, the whole war on drugs and legalizing drugs at large is beyond the scope of this discussion. Um, there have been a lot of distortions ab about the debate in cannabis, but I discussed that um, a little bit before, but the main contributors to the anti side of the referendums, whenever there's a cannabis referendum, if you follow the money are law enforcement, big pharma, the alcohol industry, the private prison industry, and the rehab industry. So if we really want these people uh, sort of um, de deciding our cannabis policy, that's, that's who's uh, contributing to the anti side of the debate, if you really look at who's funding, and then the final thing I want to say, this is my last slide, I promise. Stigma is killing people. The stigma came from the war of drugs, war on drugs. Much of the stigma against cannabis was deliberately manufactured by these pharma supported groups like the Partnership for Drug Free America and by the US government. The stigma is killing people. I have elderly people that come in and they want to use cannabis because the non steroidals are killing their kidneys. And they whisper to me, hey, doctor, can I try some medical cannabis? And they act like a SWAT team is going to barge in through the window. And I'm like, it's okay. It's legal in Massachusetts. Yes, of course you could try it. It's also keep, 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 keeping people who get in trouble with cannabis from getting treatment. I mean, we've got to get rid of the stigma. The endocannabinoid system, this neurotransmitter system that controls many of the other transmitter systems in our brains and bodies is only taught in 13% of medical schools. This has to change. The doctors have to get on the right side of history. It's absolutely pathetic. Um, there were in 2019, there were still more than 500,000 arrests for cannabis possession. Most of these people with dark skin, uh, we could do a lot better than this. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, Professor Calkins, we, uh, uh, we'll leave some time at the end of the uh, the, the presentations for if you want to respond to anything that, uh, that, that, that Dr. Grinspoon said, if that's okay. Um, uh, and so now uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, Dr. Nock. Right. Hi, everyone. I need to take over screen sharing here. Okay. Right. Rid of that. All right. I'm really excited uh, for Q and A because I think it's going to be pretty lively. Um, but hello, everyone. I, I, I do hope you're enjoying this panel so far, and I'm excited to talk to you a bit now about how we recognize decriminalization and legalization and regulating with integrity. I like to speak on the integrous regulation of our industry um, as the means to health equity. So my hope is that you'll leave this session with a new appreciation for the responsibility and really the honor that is stewarding cannabis regulatory frameworks. Um, you know, this is bigger than science and, and medicine, everyone. Like, this is bigger than even our economy. A lot of states are legalizing because they recognize that cannabis is a cash cow. That is the wrong reason to legalize, and I hope um, you'll agree. So we really must share an understanding about the powerful ways, really the myriad ways 
that this cannabis industry can bring about global prosperity for all people of all colors. Because unless we collectively work to get on the same page and ensure that cannabis does all that it was meant to do for humanity and our earth, it just won't, right? So my salient point here today will be this, that cannabis heals, right? It's inherently medicinal and we must let it as the humans who are stewarding it um, into legalization. And a click to my next slide. Okay, so over the course of my brief segment, and I will try to keep it uh, brief, um, we'll quickly review the role of the endocannabinoid system. Thanks, Dr. Grinsman, for going over it. Um, so I, I hope I won't be too repetitive, um, but also the consequences of its dysfunction on social well being. I do not believe yet all of us collectively understand the nexus that is the science of cannabis um, and how we should regulate it, right, as a consumer good. Next, we'll dissect the effects of cannabis criminalization on the resilience and well being of the communities selectively targeted by the war on drugs. And finally, we'll get to explore the meaning of cannabis health equity and discuss all the ways we must leverage cannabis to ensure that all people have equitable opportunity to actualize prosperity in their lives. So, but first, I always like to do this um, because I'm in this industry by virtue of joining this industry with my family. So, I like to take a moment, minute to. Um, provide them gratitude and also provide some context. So I'm one of four doctors in my family, my mom, dad, sister, and I um, all pivoted away from conventional medicine into cannabinology, endocannabinology, and cannabinoid medicine. Um, and we've made it our lives work to help establish these fields as recognized board subspecialties. I've also spent the last four years um, in policy and regulation, the last two of the, uh, on, as the chair of the Oregon Cannabis Commission, I was just elected to my um, third year as chair. And uh, yeah, I'm thrilled to be a fellow board member of Doctors for Cannabis Regulation with Dr. Grinspoon. Um, but my team is rounded out by my big brother, who my mom likes to call our out lawyer, um, being the lone attorney in a family of doctors, but also his wife, who bring over 15 years of legal, regulatory, business, and equity consulting experience in cannabis. Um, my brother, Zach, is a former vice chair for the Oakland Cannabis Commission. And my sister-in-law, Lawanda, runs the technical assistance to Oakland Social Equity Program through her cannabis consulting firm, Make Green Go. Um, so the whole family's in, <laughs> in this field. And, and together, we've cultivated a really keen understanding right, and an honest critique of our industry. You know, and, and we've done that through the, the eyes of the people we serve, both patients and people of color, which are the very two demographics harmed the most by cannabis prohibition. And you know, we acutely recognize how carelessly, and I wanna stress that word carelessly, um, and ignorantly our industry has thus far um, been shaped and regulated, right? Especially in the face of history. So real quick also, before we get to the good stuff, I dropped a few terms many are still not familiar with. Um, and so let's quickly review them to boost our cannabis competency, competency being key. First, we have cannabinology. They'll recognize the root canna, right? Due to its most famous associate cannabis and ology, which just means the subject of study or the study of. So when you put that together, cannabinology means the study of um, uh, the, the uses, the effects, the modes of action of cannabinoids um, and cannabimimetic substances. Next, we have endocannabinology. I consider myself an endocannabinologist, um, which is the study of the endogenous cannabinoid system, um, right? So how it works, what happens when it's dysfunctional and how to modulate it. And then lastly, we have cannabinoid medicine and that's the type of medicine my family and I practice. It's the clinical application of cannabinology and endocannabinology to patient care to correct endocannabinoid system dysfunction. All right, so let's get to it. Um, cannabis competency, I dropped that word already. I'll probably drop it a few more times, is foundational to legislating and regulating cannabis with integrity. You do not understand how frustrating it has been for me to be a physician of color um, advising policymakers and regulators in this space that wholly lack um, a command for, for cannabis. Um, and so we must learn from the sordid history of cannabis where it must be clearly communicated that prohibition was never a public health issue, folks. Um, it was an economic one and it was driven by industrialists and ideologues who felt threatened by the utility of cannabis. And, really the impact it stood to have on the petrochemical, textile, timber, and paper industries. And you know, 
very twistedly, they preyed on the racial sentiments of the time, not too different from today. And they rallied public support around prohibition. And this was in spite of the American Medical Association, right? Um, calling for its continued use and, and research. Um, but research has prevailed. And so we must also learn from really the legitimate and rigorous study of the plant's pharmacology, uh, as well as the human physiology that the plant absolutely works on. Um, and so while I'd love nothing more to take you through a thorough history lesson, and I do think knowing the history of cannabis, um, its ancient use, its, 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 its uh, use in our country, its prohibition, it's prerequisite, really, uh, it should be prerequisite to any career in this industry and certainly um, any authority in this industry. Uh, I'll get right to the point from the perspective of a medical doctor. So um, the reality is that decades of research at, at, right, in the study of um, the phytochemicals in cannabis and principally THC and CBD, right? There are most well-studied, most understood cannabinoids revealed this system, right? The most important homeostatic signaling system in the mammalian body. All mammals have this system. Uh, all animals have it except the insect. And this is the endocannabinoid system, which resides in the bigger system that is the endocannabinoid dome. I'll, I'll, I'll speak a little to that in a few moments. Um, but in reality, there is not a single physiological process in our body that is not some way modulated by the endocannabinoid system. And its principal role is to keep the body's functions in balance. And what's critical to understand for everyone, and, and, and Dr. Grinspoon hinted upon this a bit, is that um, you know, THC and the rest of this cannabinoid alphabet work on this system, the endocannabinoid system, modulating it, and most often in therapeutic and harmonious ways. Um, right in the middle of the screen here, you can see how THC and CBD both work on those opioid receptors. This is why we understand cannabis as an adjunctive therapy um, in, in pain control, right? Synergistic analgesia is achieved because of the concomitant binding to those receptors by both cannabinoids and opiate drugs. Um, and this is what we see when the endocannabinoid system is out of balance. So we call this endocannabinoid system dysfunction. Um, and as shown here, some increasingly common illnesses are considered true syndromes of endocannabinoid system overactivity or deficiency. You all should recognize these. And the root cause of endocannabinoid system dysfunction is not a head scratcher. <laughs> um, these are the top contributors to endocannabinoid system dysfunction. They are common, chronic emotional stress, chronic chemical exposures, chronic use of prescription drugs, the standard American diet, the natural course of aging and, and the epigenetics of things, right? How all of these things um, play on our genetics. And this should be familiar as these are also the top contributors to chronic illness in the general population in the United States. And honestly, as people become um, more Americanized globally, right? This is our reality today. One in 10 people have heart disease or cancer. One in five have chronic pain, about 20% of those have fibromyalgia, right? One of those endocannabinoid system of deficiency syndromes. Um, one in five has a mental health issue, IBS. One in three are suffering from insomnia, high blood pressure or prediabetes. And one in two are suffering from headaches. 30% of those are typically migraine headaches. Again, another true ECS deficiency syndrome and one in 1.5 American adults is suffering from some form of chronic stress. So for me as a clinician, um, you know, my background's in family and integrative and functional medicine. It is not surprising why so many people are choosing cannabis as medicine. Both anecdote and research are clear. They demonstrate a broad safety profile and efficacy. And um, I also wanna quickly say that cannabis is inherently medicinal, right? Cannabinoid products, the things that people are, sell, are buying, um, you know, be it flour, tincture, concentrate, you name it, they're medicinal, right? Therapeutic 100% of the time. Cannabis is not inherently recreational, right? Recreational is simply a type of personal use. And this is not the primary type of use dominating consumer trends. Um, it's just not. And, I also have a problem with referring to adult use or personal use as recreational. I'm really tired of seeing this in the media. It exists in statute in some places, and that is, that is bad. Um, we should not err on regulating cannabis as a vice industry, 
but rather an industry productive of consistent high quality and safe medicinal cannabis that both patients and adults can responsibly choose to recreate with. And, and you know, we have to remember that while we wanna minimize the, um, the risks of intoxication, euphoria, euphoria that is caused by the binding of THC to our CB1 receptors is therapeutic, right? Think about the folks suffering from PTSD or depression. Um, that euphoria is really important when we're trying to address quality of life issues. And, you know, quite frankly, honestly, in my medical opinion, I do think most people should be using cannabinoid products of varying chemical profiles and, and CBD to THC ratios on a daily basis, um, you know, and for a number of evidence-based reasons. And I, I would be quicker to compare daily cannabis use to daily use of pharmaceutical drugs, right? Pharmaceutical drugs that Americans are very dependent uh, upon. Um, and not on tobacco or alcohol, right? They're, they're incomparable. The former cannabis being inherently medicinal, like I said, having a very low potential for misuse and abuse, and the latter tobacco and, and alcohol, you know, being wholly toxic, right? Um, with a markedly higher risk of, of misuse and abuse. Um, and lastly, it's also critical for our industry to understand the import of competition, small business and craft cannabis in the industry I saw uh, you know, a remark in the, in the questions before that had some concerns around um, the economics playing out such that we might lose our craft, our craft industry. But this is so important. Given what we know about the utility of cannabis as a driver for precision medicine, right, due to its incredible genetic diversity, it is necessary for a variety, a variety of cannabinoid products of mixed chemical profiles to exist in the market so that we can serve both the wellness needs of patients and um, the clinical, excuse me, the wellness needs of the adult consumer, as well as the clinical needs of our sick population, right? And, and sometimes this does mean including high potency THC. There are some conditions where high potency THC is first line and others where it's not. Maybe another cannabinoid is the predominant player. But this is what research is demonstrating to us. This is why it's important to have a command over the science um, and pharmacology of cannabis as medicine. All right, um, so I don't think it's lost on anyone that it's really the medical and political authority um, that continues to stand in the way of people uh, and this plant as medicine, um, but also between this plant and human justice. And that's where the rest of my um, session is going to focus. So we have this elephant in the room um, and I wanna say this plainly. So I'm gonna read this with you. Um, Through its prohibition, cannabis, which was once a highly valued American crash crop grown by enslaved people was weaponized against communities of color. The so-called war on drugs criminalized black, brown and indigenous people for its use, resulting in the disproportionate enforcement of marijuana laws in our communities this disparity has contributed to intergenerational marginalization and disinvestment in the well being of Black, Brown, and Native people, impacting every determinant of health in communities of color. Um, the Oregon Health Authority recently gave a presentation on health equity, and they did not mention the impact of the war on drugs, right? That is a failure to recognize the nexus. Um, the COVID 19 pandemic has only further illuminated right, the, the worsening state of health in these communities. And, you know, unfortunately, there are no good systemic solutions in sight. And, uh, you know, I really haven't seen much more coverage in the media. And the fact is this, we cannot run from it, right? Um, what I truly appreciate about cannabis legalization is that it is forcing us to have these conversations. Um, it's, it's forcing us to confront historical and contemporary truths, and we can't fail to understand what the criminalization of marijuana has done and continues to do to, to people, and especially communities of color. Um, drug criminalization and the selective enforcement of our drug laws in minority communities has played a defining role in isolating these communities from the majority population. And when you do that, right, when you create side populations by any means, um, and then resource that population disparately, that population evolves much more slowly than the majority population. This creates the systemic disparities we're all trying to solve. <laughs> um, and they do create a major difference. And, and you know, this is outside the personal purview of individual responsibility, right? To break out of this box that cannabis prohibition built. Um, it's tricky. 
So, you know, and I don't think people realize just how badly cannabis prohibition further disrupted black lives post slavery. And I love this illustration um, because it's stark, right? On the heels of a tough fight civil rights era, just six years after the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This is what the 1970s Controlled Substances Act and the gross weaponization of, of cannabis criminalization has done. It's disrupted the nuclear family in minority communities with perpetuated poverty, perpetuated mental health problems, sustained a prison pipeline for profit, perpetuated recidivism, it's disenfranchised and, and justified the depletion of community resources. It's resulted in limited job opportunities. It stunted the wealth building out of pace with the majority population. This is why equity programming needs to include economic support for the involvement of, of, of Black, Brown, and Indigenous in, in, um, in the trade. And this is where it gets really, really unfortunate. It has made patients of color fearful to use cannabis as medicine. Right? Black, Brown, and Indigenous people are not sicker in the United States because of genetics. It's, it's because of this. Right? The medical system cannot fix black, brown, and indigenous, indigenous health. This industry has a responsibility to respond because this is a system's problem and we need to systemically fix it and fast. Um, the persisting impacts of prohibition must be remediated in every aspect of cannabis legalization and reform. And we all need to hold our lawmakers along with every one of us accountable for contemplating designing, implementing, enforcing, and measuring, right? Making sure that it works, meaningful solutions. And until this happens, there won't be any justice. I'm just gonna state it plainly, right? There's no cannabis social equity program out here in this United States that does attempt to right these wrongs, right? Holistically, um, that restores the health of these communities. And, and really that's because social equity programs are not informed by health, right? Competency, right? This is theme. So what is health, right? So quickly, you know, this is my favorite holistic definition of it. Um, health is the state of one's mental, physical, and spiritual being, but it's also the state of community well-being or the state of societal well-being. And it's determined by four factors, economic determinants, environmental determinants, human determinants, and social determinants. So I don't anymore call the determinants of health social determinants of health because uh, the way we'll, we'll, we'll review here, social determinants are one component. So these are the four determinants of well-being lined up here. So I want to take a brief moment to review. Um, human determinants of well-being are the states of one's knowledge, skills, ability, capability, adapt and adaptability. It's also um, the state of their physical, mental, and spiritual fitness. Environmental determinants are the states of the air, water, land, and soil, outdoor spaces and housing. Economic determinants are the states or really even existence of economic resources, like income and savings and assets and, and access to capital, um, as well as the existence and state of personal and collective agency, right, the choice over how those resources flow through one's household or community. And then lastly, we have social determinants. These are the states of social infrastructure and systems, right, or networks that we establish through policy. Um, that do or do not facilitate access to the rest of these, to the human, environmental, and economic resources, services, and justice, or, or that do or do not facilitate social participation, cooperation, trust, cohesion, and productivity of the people living together in a society. Now, I know this is a lot to unpack. Um, I speak on this a lot, so just bleh, um, but this is also how critically we do need to appraise and address healing in 2020. It seems uncomplicated, but if we unpack it in this way, we can start to meet, again, make meaningful step-by-step -step solutions to addressing this, right? So, you know, at the end of the day, we all have to understand that we're all healthcare workers as we design policy and infrastructure or, or start businesses, um, that health, right, at the beginning of, and the end of the day, whether good or poor, is the net result of all these determinants, right? So put it another way, the state of one's health or that of a communities or, or that of a society is the sum of the systemic inputs of the ecosystem in which one resides. And so equitable access to well-being is what health equity is. And it's the impartial and intentional distribution of attention and investment across all of these determinants such that they're optimized and balanced across the whole population. Um, 
you know, this is how we care for health, like I said, and we have to make sure we have the social infrastructures that facilitate it. So I just have a few more slides here. Um, and, and I hope we can agree that equity should achieve well-being for all people. Um, and we can measure that across the four pillars of health equity. These are mirroring the four determinants of well-being. Um, and and this is, this is the, the full circle moment, right? So through systemic racism and the war on drugs, Black, Brown, and Indigenous people have been denied the assurance of all of this. Right through that intergenerational disinvestment, um, people have been denied health equity and the realization of, of well being. Right, so we have to think about how we set up legalization and regulation in a health equity centric way. And this is why I no longer say we need to be creating social equity programs, we just need to make sure policy is equitable. Um, and I believe that cannabis health equity should be our true north here. So cannabis equity is this, the leverage of the economy, taxation, and utility of all cannabis varieties to achieve health equity, right? Where cannabis was and still is wielded against communities of color, we must now wield it to heal them and for the benefit of everyone. So when we think critically, and, and, and really I want us to, to do this 100% of the time, um, Right. Again, it's not so simple. Cannabis is not a quick fix to the economy just because people want to buy it. Um, we have to see that cannabis provides seemingly endless root solutions to healing our environments, our economy, um, our no social infrastructures. Here I have 50,000 uses across agricultural, industrial, medical, and nutritional um, you know, end, end uses. And um, you know, it's our job to ensure that our policies, regulations, and industry practices that govern cannabis do though. Do so, wield these things to create equity, right? Um, we have to cut the nonsense. <laughs> we have to get this done. And you know, our communities that have been most targeted should be the first to benefit. I call these our high impact zones, the places which we should be implementing our solutions first, establishing proof of concept, because if they work in these communities that are the farthest behind, right, the most disinvested in, we can demonstrate that cannabis is a root solution to really, really solving some of our global ecology issues, right? Um, from repleting soil to building houses to, to fueling with clean energy to using cannabis as medicine and food. Y'all, it's, it's limitless, okay? Um, and, and, and really I'm done here. And the last thing I will say is that I am actually really proud that Oregon's going to help demonstrate how we can get this done. Um, over the summer, I helped write our Oregon Cannabis Equity Bill and it calls for the first 25% of cannabis tax revenue on an annual and ongoing basis um, be used to directly address community reparations and revitalization overseen by a cannabis equity oversight body to ensure that we get this done. Um, so right now we're in the middle of, of speaking with state representatives to garner support. Um, and I really hope we get this win because this truly is the most holistic and progressive cannabis legislation that I've seen to date. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, for our final uh, presentation, Professor Huberfeld. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jay. And um, thanks to all of the amazing co-panelists on this first panel of what promises to be a really rich conversation. I am so excited to see where the rest of this conference goes given how exciting our first hour has been already. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen as well. And I'm gonna take us in a slightly different direction, though it is thematically uh, very much of a piece with what we've been hearing so far. And so what I'm gonna talk about is health equity, federalism and marijuana law, because Jay asked us to think about what the status of the law is in 2020. And of course, this was incredibly prescient because we've had this round of ballot initiatives recently, and we see that the trend appears to be going in one direction toward some kind of legalization in most states. But a lot of my work centers on the meaning of the use of the structure of federalism in health policy. And in particular, I think about what it means to make that choice of divided governance when it's not constitutionally necessary 
And we need to think harder, in my view, about which level of government is regulating an important health policy issue, because we know from history that the states do not always do what we think they will. And on the other hand, each state has a long history of discriminating in particular ways that are predictable. So that when we choose federalism as a policy tool, we know that we're choosing predictable variability. And that variability has deep impact on health equity. Now, as we've heard so far, this is obviously an incredibly complex, dynamic, and also very tense um, and, and difficult area to talk about. People have really strong feelings about the tensions and inequities that have arisen over time due to the war on drugs. And I think it's actually important to take stock of where we are in this particular phase of the conversation. And I would say that this phase arguably began with the California Compassionate Use Act that culminated in the Supreme Court decision of Gonzales v. Raich in 2005. And I like to do a thought experiment, which is what if Angel Raich and Diane Monson were not white women? What if instead, they were the much more commonly arrested black men who were having their homes raided by the DEA. Would we be having the same conversation today if this weren't our jumping off point? And the reason that I ask this question is, of course, as we heard earlier speakers touch on, uh, the arrests for marijuana use are half of all drug arrests. And of course, black Americans are nearly four times more likely to be arrested for possession of marijuana. There's no doubt that we're facing both structural racism and historic racism when we're talking about what it means to think through using marijuana, when we think through what it means to legalize marijuana. And I would say that the particular people at the center of Gonzales v. Raich actually had quite a large impact on how we think about and what we're talking about when we're thinking about legalization of marijuana. And the reason I say that is that if you're not aware, Angel Raich in particular is a pretty fierce libertarian. She has a public website and her website indicates that she is deeply anti-regulation. Uh, she has very strongly held sort of market-based views about who should have access to marijuana but also somewhat contradictorily, she is very much against the Affordable Care Act and the access to care that it promises. And so I would argue that these sort of libertarian and economic views were really what was underlying the arguments that went to the Supreme Court in terms of California's Compassionate Use Act. So even though the framing was medical legalization, I think that we should be talking about the contradiction, the tension between this libertarian, anti-regulation, support of the economic industry conversation, and what it takes to achieve health equity. Because health equity is often incompatible with an anti-regulation stance. And of course, federalism is a key feature of this tension. So we have this unsustainable tension between what federal law prohibits and what state law is now requiring. And we know that the people who suffer the most from that tension are people of color. We're sitting at this complex center of a variety of laws that touch on a number of topics. We've heard a lot about the war on drugs already. It's driven the ways in which we're thinking about what legalization means for marijuana in particular. But there's this disconnect, I think, too, between what we're seeing in the ballot initiatives at the state level and what our normative ideal would be. In some ways, the ballot initiatives at the state level reflect what exists already. In other words, people are already using cannabis for medical purposes. People are already using cannabis to alleviate anxiety and stress and uh, with apologies, recreationally. And so I do think it's worth noting that this trend of state legalization not only is itself highly variable, but it doesn't necessarily reflect what we would want legalization to be, but rather what is already occurring. In other words, making sure that the people using are not being arrested for behaviors that are so commonplace that making them criminal feels absurd in this day and age. Yet again, the ACLU tells us that people who are black are four times more likely to still be arrested, even in states where there has been legalization of use. We see this in DC and Colorado. 
And so what I want to focus on is what's happening at the federal level, because it is the federal government that created this problem in the first place. If we're going to look to the Controlled Substances Act in particular, we want to understand what could happen at the federal level, especially with a new Biden administration. And so there are a couple of bills that I want to focus on and, and bring to your attention. The first is the Marijuana Justice Act that was introduced by Senator Booker in 2017 and was reintroduced last year. Senator Cory Booker, if you are not familiar with him, uh, hopefully you know he was the mayor of Newark, New Jersey before he became a senator. He lived in Newark. He witnessed the impact of the so-called war on drugs. He recognizes that you can't really have a war on an inanimate object and that a war is really waged on people. And so in addition to the Marijuana Justice Act, he has introduced three other bills that sort of fill out the Marijuana Justice Act. So I want to talk about the Marijuana Justice Act and the three bills that he's introduced, but also to give you sort of a bigger picture view, the Marijuana Justice Act has influenced deeply the Moore Act, which is the act that has been sponsored by Senator Kamala Harris, now VP elect Kamala Harris. And so it's important to see what's proposed in that bill. And then there's Senator Schumer's bill, the Marijuana Freedom and Opportunity Act. So I just wanna quickly walk through these so you can see what's happening at the federal level and put it in context of what uh, Vice Pre uh, excuse me, President-elect Biden is proposing. So when we look at the Marijuana Justice Act, it was an act, excuse me, a bill designed to decriminalize marijuana. It removes it from the list of scheduled substances under the Controlled Substances Act. As everybody here is probably aware, but I'll say it anyway, a drug that's placed in Schedule I of the Controlled Substances Act is deemed a drug that has no medical benefits whatsoever. And so a drug that's part of Schedule I not only is illegal, but also cannot be prescribed by physicians. So the Marijuana Justice Act decriminalizes marijuana. It reduces federal funds for states that do not legalize marijuana and that have a disproportionate arrest rate or a disproportionate incarceration rate for marijuana offenses. So this is actually really important. I wanna hang on to this idea this, that the federal spending power can be used to influence state decision-making in this venue. It also directs federal courts to expunge convictions for marijuana use and possession, and it establishes a community reinvestment fund, meaning grants and communities that are most affected by the war on drugs, providing things like job training, reentry services for people who have been incarcerated, uh, expenses related to expungement, uh, facilitating libraries, community centers, programs for youth and health education programs. So this is really, in many ways, a complete package. As Senator Booker would put it, the Marijuana Justice Act seeks to reverse decades of unfair treatment for people of color. In addition, the REDEEM Act, which I mentioned a moment ago, the Record Expungement Designed to Enhance Employment Act would make it so that federal employers and federal contractors cannot ask about criminal history when people are applying for jobs. And the Fair Chance Act makes it so that um, there are, oh, excuse me, that was the Fair Chance Act. The REDEEM Act is the act that seeks to fix other aspects of society when someone leaves prison. So for example, um, it seals records. It makes it so that states um, can raise the age of adult responsibility to age 18. Um, it significantly improves access to social programs like SNAP and welfare. Um, it makes it so that there are um, more accurate background checks conducted um, and, and other aspects of uh, trying to make it so that people who have been incarcerated are treated more fairly in society. So in addition to the Marijuana Justice Act, it's worth it to consider the Moore Act. Again, this is Kamala Harris's bill. Again, this is a bill that decriminalizes marijuana, removes it from the Controlled Substances Act list of scheduled substances, and it replaces references to marijuana with cannabis. This linguistic difference is one that means a lot to a lot of people. There's a, a very racialized history to the word marijuana that many people shy away from now. It requires the Bureau of Labor Statistics to publish demographic data on cannabis business owners and employees to the point that we just heard earlier. This makes it easier to understand 
who needs support in establishing businesses in this space and creates a trust fund to support programs and services for those businesses. It makes it so that there's a tax on cannabis products that get deposited into the trust fund. All of the features of the MORE Act are geared toward legalization and the economics of this particular industry. What's missing here, the federal funding that would influence what states do. And so this is an important difference between the MORE Act and Senator Booker's Act, because remember the Marijuana Justice Act makes it so that federal funds would be reduced for the states that don't legalize marijuana and that have disproportionate arrest rates or disproportionate incarceration rates. And disproportionate means not only people of color, but also people who are low income, who are also disproportionately harmed by the war on drugs. In addition, we have Schumer's bill, the Marijuana Freedom and Opportunity Act. This is another bill that is focused on decriminalization relative to the Controlled Substances Act. It establishes a trust fund to, again, assist in businesses that are getting into the cannabis industry. It also requires some public health research that's notable. It requires federal research on the impact of marijuana use on highway safety and public health, authorizes federal restrictions on marketing, authorizes grants for state and local governments to expunge or seal convictions. But also this particular bill pushes the decision-making back down to the states. And as the PR for this bill put it, it allows states to continue to function as laboratories of democracy and to decide how they will treat marijuana possession. So that language is a little bit troubling in that it is generally not surprising how states will treat drug crimes and who will be arrested and convicted for drug crimes. So pushing this back down to the states without the kind of carrot or stick that we see in Senator Booker's bill is potentially problematic. So again, this was the state landscape that we saw just a moment ago. The state landscape reveals that particularly if we look in the deep south, while we do have some comprehensive uh, legislation that has occurred, most of the more comprehensive efforts to legalize access to cannabis have occurred on the coasts. Well, why does this matter? Well, if we take again the example of the fact that people of color are much more likely to be arrested for possession of marijuana, it's important to also note that Medicaid plays an important role in the transition from incarceration back to community life. And when we look at the states that have expanded Medicaid, it's notable that the states, the 12 holdout states in the Deep South in particular, are the states that still have fairly restrictive cannabis laws. In addition, we can see those are the states that have the most people enrolled in Medicaid who are people of color. And further, we can see that those are states that limit the availability of Medicaid enrollment post incarceration. And so when we're trying to look at the whole picture, when we're trying to look at not only what legalization means and what it means for people of color, but also what all of these policies mean taken in the whole, it's clear that we have to figure out what our priorities are. And it seems that the priority, at least descriptively, is one that decriminalizes cannabis. But we have to look beyond that. Now, one question, of course, is what will President-elect Biden do? Well, it appears that he supports decriminalizing marijuana, expunging criminal records, and also trying to make it so that people don't have to pay for expungement. But like Senator Schumer's bill, he would allow states to continue to make their own choices regarding legalization and would seek to make it easier to conduct research on marijuana's positive and negative health impacts by making it a Schedule II drug. So there's really two things to think about there. One is the impact of decriminalization and what it means to push the policy down to the states. That looks very much like how alcohol policy works. What's one thing that we know about how prohibition worked for alcohol? it wasn't effective. Everybody thought the law was for someone else. And that's very much what we see in the cannabis space as well. 
that means that enforcement tends to be very uneven and it has everything to do with the history that we've already heard about, about the war on drugs being focused on people of color, but it also has to do with the fact that prosecutorial discretion makes it so that the biases that are intrinsic in human nature come out when it comes to enforcement of drug crimes. And so if the move is to decriminalize but push the decision making down to the states. What we're going to see is continued predictable variability amongst the states. And if our priority is not to allow that to happen, if our priority is addressing the underlying determinants of health, if our priority is social justice, then we have to think about the buckets that are evident in these legal moves. Is it that we're trying to focus on decriminalization and racial justice? Is it that we're trying to focus on the economics? We see that states are turning to decriminalization because they have budgetary, budgetary shortfalls. We see that there's a powerful industry on the rise. Are these the ways that we can actually make it so that people of color get a foothold in this industry? There was this huge expose in the Boston Globe about the problems that have happened in a state where equity was actually prioritized. What will it take for us to understand how law actually achieves equity. It means that we cannot have only state action. We must have at least a strong federal baseline determining what it takes to both decriminalize and then also achieve the difficult feat of fair regulation going forward. Decriminalization in the context of anti-regulation of libertarian and economic and industrial instincts won't be enough to get at the underlying determinants of health that make it so that health equity is such a big issue here. We have to talk about health policy and equity in terms of understanding what we mean when we look at that big bucket. Are we thinking about pain management? Are we thinking about safety and efficacy of drugs? Are we thinking about access to care writ large? Medical care is so expensive that even if people of color were inclined to ask their physicians if they could use cannabis for medical purposes, they may not even be able to access it because it's expensive. I think we have a huge number of questions to ask. I need to stop there so that we have time for Q&A, but thank you very much for your time. Terrific, thank you so much. So um, we have, I don't know, we. 10 minutes, maybe a little bit more because we got started a little late uh, for questions. But I want to uh, let first invite uh, Professor Calkins if you'd like to 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 respond to, to to anything that was said. I know Dr. Binsman mentioned you specifically. So, oh no, mostly I think we should uh, allow time for questions. The one thing I will say because it came up in the questions in chat is people were asking about that pie chart where I said about half of cannabis consumption is by people with a substance use disorder, they asked, you know, wh where does that come from? And uh, this is self-report of problems with the substance. If you self-report enough problems with work and social interaction, then you get categorized. But I really wanna stress, this is people with any substance use disorder. Some of it has cannabis use disorder, but it also includes consumption by people with opioid use disorder or alcoholism or whatever. But the short answer is it's self-report of problems is the basis for assessing the substance use disorder. Uh, okay, so I'm looking at the Q, uh, the Q and A. Some of the questions have, uh, were asked and then kind of answered already. Um, if people have questions, please uh, uh, feel free to put them, add them to the Q and A. Um, if anybody else on the panel would like to ask anybody else on the panel a question, that's always fun. Uh, so, so feel free to do that uh, as I look through the Q and A um, to find. Uh, there's uh, there's there's one question um, uh, for Dr. Grinspoon about uh, the, what the question is. What information do you have about how cannabis affects anesthesia users? Oh, that's a really important question. Uh, first of all, the data that we have is that people who are using cannabis need more anesthesia than people who are not using anesthesia, uh, cannabis. Um, <laughs> hopefully everybody's using anesthesia going through surgery. But what's really important about that is um, that it gets to the, the question of um, doctor-patient communication. Uh, the more that people feel that they can be open and honest with their doctors about their cannabis use, um, the more that their doctors will know about it. And 
I think it's really patients have a role of being open and honest and doctors have a role of creating a climate where patients um, can be open and honest. And I think doctors in the past have, have sort of been a little bit um, snooty, snooty and dismissive of patients and judgmental. And I think it's really important for doctors, even if you're anti-cannabis or neutral or don't know much about it or whatever, you can't be judgmental because patients have to feel comfortable talking about it. And this is a perfect example. You need to know if your patient's using cannabis, you could tell the anesthesiologist so they know about it so that they might need to use more anesthesia. It's just a perfect example of how communication is everything. And I just want to say also, it, it is the medical provider's job to have, again, a command of the pharmacology of cannabinoids um, and around the physiology of the endocannabinoid system. My mom is um, in this space and she is a 32-year board certified anesthesiologist. And she she responds to a lot of the concerns around um, needing to use more anesthetics and surgery as that's just common. Like it's our job to understand pharmacology and physiology. And it's not just cannabis. We need to know any substances a patient consumes prior to surgery so that we can make pragmatic decisions about medical care. Um, that is an unbiased approach. It is our job to be unbiased. It is our job not to carry our religiosity <laughs> around cannabis into the patient um, physician uh, experience, right? And the other thing she says as an anesthesiologist is that if she knew while she was in the OR, what she knows today about cannabinoids, she would have had patients on a cannabinoid therapy regimen pre and post surgery to reduce um, the need of pain medications after surgery to reduce anxiety around surgery. Um, and so she truly believes there is a whole lot of utility in using cannabinoids um, acutely uh, in the surgical arena too. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Um, I, I wanna um, maybe pass along a question that, that was for Professor Calkins and who, but you, you answered it in the, in the, in the, key, uh, in the in the question and answer box, but I think it's generally interesting. So maybe I could uh, could ask it, and if you could say something to uh, publicly about it, it's the question is from Ryan Stoa, who is who is will be a, a panelist at a later uh, at a later um, uh, panel. But the question was: To what extent do you anticipate that the market will support a diversity of production models? Will the drop in the cost of production drive craft producers out of business entirely? Or is there evidence that consumers will pay more for cannabis that reflects value choices other than price? For example, cannabis that's grown more locally, equitably, or sustainably. <laughs> so I'm laughing a little bit because I suspect maybe it was Ryan who asked a question and I said, you should read Ryan Stowe who disagrees with me. Yeah, so the, the general question is what will the structure of this industry be? And I'm focused here on the recreational industry because the majority of cannabis mm. consumption is recreational, not medical. And the, the short answer is we don't know. There are different um, di different possibilities. It could be highly disaggregated. Uh, it could be very centralized. And uh, Ryan is a very articulate advocate of the idea that it will stay a relatively broken up industry with a lot of smaller players. Um, my best guess is that the economies of scale in production, but even more in marketing, will mean that the bulk of the consumption of recreational cannabis will be provided by uh, quite large companies and that the craft or artisanal side of the industry will be something like the size of the craft beer industry. But I think no one really knows. And I think it's great to listen to multiple people's guesses on that interesting question. Thank you. Uh, anybody else have any, uh, anybody, other panelists want to want to uh, weigh in on that? Yeah, Dr. I, I um, think there's sort of a fight for the soul of the cannabis industry right now. And, you know, it's really interesting. I about five years ago, and I naively went to a cannabis industry conference, like a big cannabis industry conference, sort of as a um, fly on the wall. And, you know, I was sort of expecting it to be a Grateful Dead concert. And I was like such a fish out of water. It was like, it could have been like a RJ Reynolds, um, you know, convention and everybody used the word wellness like to sort of cover themselves, but it really, it just was very disappointing. But then again, I know so many people in the cannabis industry that are from the movement that um, are very good hearted people. And I, I honestly think there's sort of a fight for the soul of the cannabis industry. I think that um, there's not really one cannabis industry. There's like two cannabis industries. There's like the tobacco, alcohol, corporate sort of um, 
people that are that are trying to um, create brands and actually are doing some really unethical things like arguing against homegrown cannabis because they can't make money off of it and trying to get that into the state bills. Um, and then there are a lot of really uh, people that have worked really hard and actually sacrificed uh, to get it legalized that are trying to get into the industry because they really believe in it. They, they probably tend to be more of the craft uh, cannabis people. But I think that um, because of the cultural history, there's always going to be a market for like um, the local, the little guy and the guy with good credentials or the woman, the people with good credentials. So I think there's always going to be sort of two cannabis industries. Um, I sort of agree with um, with uh, Dr. Hawkins that there's going to be like the Budweiser and then there's going to be the craft beer. But I think that a lot of it's going to be driven culturally uh, just by the fact that so many people, it's been such a cultural fight for so many people. I don't think they're all going to switch to Budweiser. I think their heart and soul is in legalization and they're going to um, kind of stick with their own uh, in terms of what they buy. Well, and, and for, in Oregon, you know, I'm, I'm in Oregon, right? We're, we're an adult use and medical state. Uh, all adults can grow four plants. If you're a patient, you can grow up to 12. And we saw record revenues this year in our industry, right? So home grows are not a threat. We, Oregon is the, the center of craft many things, <laughs> beer, wine, cannabis. Um, we, we, we have the gamut here. And I think also what we have, it's pretty unique. We don't cap licenses. We have a competitive marketplace that is equitable, right? We are very concerned with New Jersey's enabling bill right now because it caps opportunity right? There's zero equity in it at all whatsoever. Um, the only other thing I wanted to say is that 100% of the time, there is a biopsychosocial spiritual reason for somebody's use, right? And re recreation, recreating might be a personal use, but even when we get into misuse and abuse, there is an underlying physiological reason why people are using cannabis. And we have to remember that when we're building this industry full of cannabinoid products that are pharmacologically active on the bodies of humans. So there is a responsibility for industry to ensure that they are creating cannabinoid products that are healthful, right, healthy, and not damaging to our consumer. That's that's the responsibility that we have um, for the, the ethos of the cannabis plant itself, let alone the end consumer, many of which, and this is the trend in Oregon, we saw medical patients who registered decline, right, and an increase of adult consumers who are using cannabis as medicine. So we, we have to remember that cannabis is medicinal first. I, I'm sorry, so on my stats, just the, the question is, are you using it for medical reasons? And the minority of consumption is by people who- will A say, lot of people yes, do not know, I right? I define it myself as medical use. So, so that, that's Correct, just- Correct, right? So, cause we define medical use as using it for a qualifying condition. Right, and that's irresponsible for statute to define how a, how a physician can certify a patient for medical use. There are myriad reasons supported by research to demonstrate that cannabis is has utility in treating a number of conditions. Right, if we're bound by the six conditions that our state says we can write authorizations for, I understand why a person might not check off. I'm using this for a medical reason. Right, winding down at the end of the day, or relaxing, or even feeling some euphoria if one in 1.5 American adults is suffering from chronic stress or depression and anxiety. If I'm reaching for this substance to feel better, that is still a therapeutic use. And I think at the end of the day, it just comes back to competency and an individual understanding um, consciously the reasons why they're reaching for cannabis. Yeah, no, it's a fair point. And we, and, we, and we have to be careful about how we label. That's why I have an issue with us calling a whole market recreational. <laughs> so, um, so because that perhaps, places the emphasis on the vice, right? Well, I, I'm not trying to attach any judgment to whether recreational is good or bad. It, it's sometimes maybe useful to distinguish um, sort of recreational wellness and medical, where medical is to treat a specific disease. And, and in that trichotomy, wellness is a relatively large portion of it. And as you say, stuff like relaxation, and it's the same as with alcohol. And my, my prediction, no, nobody knows for sure, is my prediction was when there's a large non-medical market and people are able to purchase non-medical product, they will use the non-medical product primarily for those patient 
purposes in the same way that they do now with, with alcohol. I don't think they're going to be getting a prescription from their doctor to unwind, for example. Yeah, well, the reality is that we shouldn't need to. We, we are over-regulating wellness and therapy in this world, period. Um, plants make choosing wellness very democratic. It, it is the institutions that have placed barriers upon us, right? We don't have free agency. We don't have, we, we don't have products in the market to choose from that are inherently healthy, but cannabis could be that thing. You see what I'm saying? Um, again, like, and I'm not trying to argue with you. I just want the people who are viewing to understand that the way we talk about cannabis um, matters, right? Um, the words that we assign to regulation matters. Word casting, if you will, has far reaching implications. Cannabis is medicinal. Medical use and recreational use are behaviors, right? That's, that's intention, that's a choice. But the plant inherently is medicinal, right? That's, that's, that's the point I'm trying to drive home. Can I just, yeah. I'm not gonna pick one side or the other, but I think there's just, a, it's sort of an artificial dichotomy and I think there's a lot of overlap. And I, I just actually wrote a paper for this for Harvard Health, which isn't published yet, but they did a study of um, people who went to adult use or recreational dispensaries and something like two thirds of them also used it for medical purposes. And then they did a study of people who used it for medical purposes and something like 40% also used it recreationally. So I just think there's a huge overlap in that to, to try to um, pigeonhole it. And I think you guys are both sort of agreeing with this into medical versus recreational or whether it's a third category of wellness is, is sort of um, semantics to a certain extent because it's kind of a continuum and there's a lot of overlap. So maybe the easier way to differentiate it is the regulatory status of the producer who sells that. And my prediction is that 10 years down the road, the majority of cannabis is going to be produced by companies that are regulated like the Budweiser and RJR Reynolds. They're not going to be, it's not going to be produced by companies that are getting FDA approval for their product uh, the way that a pharmaceutical drug is. And I, and I hope so. I just hope that there's more um, genetic diversity. So I hope this that we do see, you know, the um, uh, we see it play out such that we support small businesses and, and craft cannabis because that genetic diversity is important to have outside of the biopharma and pharmaceutical realm. So I, I agree with you, but I, I hope that's the case because again, at the end of the day, we need to make sure that people have access to choose cannabis as medicine, and when it's only ruled and governed by big pharma, well, then we inherently limit people's access and exposure to affordable solutions in cannabis. Well, I Animus. think we're out of time. Oh. Um, we should probably, uh, do you have a, a very quick comment, Doctor? Oh, I was gonna say cannabis might even become obsolete as we're learning the endocannabinoid system. They might, for example, be able to develop a drug that does all the good things that cannabis does that doesn't have any of the side effects. Like if someone doesn't want to get high, they might be able to just stimulate those parts of the receptors that uh, ease pain, but doesn't don't cause the high. I mean, they were just at the beginning of this revolution of drug development. Now that we're understanding the endocannabinoid system that this is just the very beginning, what we're seeing now. Um, so I know legalization is happening, but just in terms of drug development with the endocannabinoid system, we're just at the very beginning. It's going to be very exciting what we're going to see. Well, I want to, uh, I think we should wrap this up. I want to thank our panelists for a terrific session. Really, thank you so much. Uh, we, th the conference itself takes about a 20 minute break or so, and we're back uh, uh, for those who would like to join us for the next panel is at 3.30, the continuing effects of federal illegality, taxation, banking, and more. Uh, thank you very much for, for a great panel and have a great rest of the day. Thanks, thank everybody. Thank you.